Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Origin Seminar. Today, we have uh, Jacob Bruno. Uh, Jacob has a long affiliation with University of Arizona. Uh, he joined U of A first as an undergrad and then a graduate student in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, uh, working with Professor Lucy uh, Zuris. After receiving his PhD in 2021, uh, he joined LPL as an NSF postdoc fellow. Uh, working with Professor Tom Zaga. Uh, Jacob uh, was also a member of the Earth in other solar system team and now a member of the Alien Earth team. Today, Jacob will talk about the complex organic molecules in the SM. Uh, Jacob, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone, in person and on Zoom. I'm happy today to be discussing some work I've been doing since grad school, really up to the present day, regarding chemical complexity in the interstellar medium. So today I'll discuss methanol, fullerenes, and hopefully carbon nanotubes. So I come from a chemistry background and uh, specifically astrochemistry, which is concerned with the identification of material in different space environments, the principal tool of which is spectroscopy. And I like this quote from Douglas Adams. It says, space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. And so my background, I'm used to a lot of remote observations because there are so many different environments that we cannot send sample return mission to a lander, a rover, it's just out of our reach so far. And so I wanted to kind of give an overview of these different sources, which we can study with radio observatories and kind of interesting things we can find to get chemical complexity in regions that we can't possibly go to and take for example collection. So I'll start with the evolved star, that star as it lives, acts like a nuclear factory it manufactures different elements and it dies how it lives so the size of the star determines its death process uh, low or intermediate mass stars like our sun could go through something called the asymptotic giant branch phase uh, larger stars can overcome electron degeneracy pressure and undergo supernova events so the AGB stars, the lower or average stars, form into a planetary nebula. Larger stars, a supernova remnant. But regardless of how a star dies, the end result is the same. The material from the star gets ejected out into the interstellar medium. And these form diffuse clouds, which can interact with other clouds gravitationally, perhaps forming dense clouds. And if there's enough material, you get star forming regions. And we're fortunate to live in this era of astronomy because we're determining that pretty much every solar system that forms has the formation of planets and moons. And the cycle begins all over again. We have uh, comets and meteorites that form in the interim, 67P, which a lander was sent to. Uh, we're also fortunate that we have so many sample return missions to show our solar system the chemistry involved in it. But we can't go to most of these places. We can't go to a planetary nebula. We can't go to a Orion. So we are constrained by remote observations. And with radio astronomy, we have a very helpful tool that when molecules are in the gas phase, they're free to rotate. Those energy levels are quantized. There's a lot of molecular hydrogen out in space. And so that hydrogen will collide with a molecule that we may be interested in, excite it to an upper rotational level, which can then decay by the emission of a photon. Now, these energy levels are dependent on the structure of the molecule, the constituent nuclei. And those energy levels are unique to the molecule, even including is isotope substitution, you can have isotopologs. This provides a unique spectral signature, which is uh, less present in 
IR or optical or visible astronomy. So these rotational transitions act like fingerprints. We can definitively say that a molecule is out there by identifying these rotational transitions. So I'm going to talk about, firstly, a project involving uh, observations of methanol. And this is the facility we use, the ARO 12 meter telescope, radio telescope. So it doesn't have to be very shiny. We're reflecting radio waves. It's not a, a visible telescope. And so this is a single dish telescope. It's on an interferometer array. So we quickly discuss how the radio telescope works. Again, we're fortunate in radio astronomy that we can observe night and day. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about sun avoidance. Radio signals come in from the sky, reflect off the primary reflector into a nutating subreflector through a hole in the center of the dish, past the primary selection mirror, and into the radio receiver. And so how do we know what we're actually looking at? How can we derive something useful? Well, if we know where the source is, we can look at the source and what we see is a column through the sky. And then we can also look at a place where our source isn't, where it's hopefully blank. It doesn't have anything of interest that would affect our measurements. We observe on the on and off position, subtract the two spectra, and that is our source signal. And talking very briefly about the receiver, how it works, we take the sky frequency, we mix it with the local oscillator frequency to get a low intermediate frequency, which we can then amplify for better detection. This is heterodyne receiving. So we could just take the telescope and if we wanted to look at, say, the Orion Nebula, we could just look at the Orion Nebula for hours and hours. But the problem is clouds can get in the way or satellites or a bird flies over. So what we do is we take short single scans, uh, just about six minutes in length, on and off. And we just subtract it too, but this is six minutes of integration time. And you see the peak to peak noise is about 10 millikelvin. And we do this over and over again so that we can eliminate bad scans when a cloud comes or an airplane. And we average them together. And of course, the signal is uh, not random. The noise should be random. And so by averaging together, our signal and noise improves. So you see here the peak to peak noise is much less than 10 millikelvin. How long we need depends on, of course, the intensity of the line. Uh, a one millikelvin line could take several hours. It could take 100 hours, depending on the source, how we're getting on and off of it. Uh, we may have to swing the dish entirely, or we could mutate that subreflector I mentioned earlier. And that affects that. If you're position switching, you're swinging the whole telescope around, you're looking through a completely different section of the atmosphere and your baselines become very unstable. So it's harder to get uh, good integration time on sources like that. And uh, if we could take a source, we can look at a specific fre a frequency, a fingerprint of a molecule for interest in say, uh, hydrogen cyanide as an example. Or if we're interested in the source, we can scan a range of the frequencies and get a complete chemical picture of that source. So when I started graduate school, this was the amount of frequency information you could collect at once. Uh, surveys would take years. It'd take years to get this amount of information. But with the installation of the new ARO wideband spectrometer, this is how much information you can get at once. You can get eight times that amount, and it's a uh, we're living in the golden age of radio astronomy where we can just get a complete picture of a source in a matter of weeks instead of years. So I'm, this talk is about chemical complexity and I wanna explain what I mean by that as an astrochemist. This is a table of the currently known molecules in interstellar space organized by the number of constituent atoms. And you'll see that it's mostly di, uh, 
and triatomic molecules. As you increase the number of constituent atoms, things become very rare indeed. And you actually have a jump between 13 atoms and 60 atoms. So huge gap, right? Uh, and the C60, C70, that was discovered back in 2010. So before that, we just, 13 was like the highest. Um, so I'm going to discuss fullerenes. This is a cartoon illustration of C60 and methanol. Now, to an organic chemist, methanol being complex seems silly, or to a biochemist, but to an astrochemist, methanol has six atoms, and it's getting in the rare side of things. Uh, it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So with regards to methanol uh, discussion, this project involved the habitability of the Milky Way galaxy. And so people have been speculating about the region considered habitable for life in the galaxy as the galactic habitable zone, similar to a planetary habitable zone, a regular solar system. And there's been discussions in different parameters, what makes the galactic habitable zone. People look at supernova frequency that if a supernova happens, it wipes out a solar system that's not exactly habitable, uh, temperature constraints, presence of liquid water, uh, metallicity, if the metallicity is too low, do you form rocky planets? I mean, are only rocky planets habitable? So there's a lot of discussion about this. And I was fascinated to studying this topic that we actually don't know the, the precise distance of our solar system from the galactic center. It's kind of like if you're inside of a house trying to figure out what the outside looks at. We, we can see other galaxies fine, but ours, we're inside of it, so it's a bit more difficult uh, that there's actually any kind of uncertainty in the distance of our solar system from the center of the galaxy was surprising to me. But we're about a third of the way out. We're about eight kiloparsecs, and that value changes every couple of years. But uh, what is this habitable zone? Well, in 2008, Dr. Samantha Blair uh, suggests an alternative way of looking at this habitable zone, which is the presence of chemical complexity, prebiotic molecules. She traced formaldehyde, uh, again, looking at the fingerprint transitions of that molecule in 69 different molecular clouds at different galactocentric radii. Uh, specifically in the outer regions of the galaxy. So 12 to 23.5 kiloparsecs. And, you know, it's uh, either 50% farther away than our solar system or three times the distance of our solar system from the center of the galaxy. Interestingly, she detected formaldehyde in many of these sources, including six, which were over 20 kiloparsecs away from the galactic center. So seems like prebiotic chemistry, this kind of complex organic chemistry is present out the outskirts of the galaxy. And this is an example of that fingerprint spectrum. So it's all the way out to the edge. And we really wanted to follow up on this study to see what other complex organic molecules are out there on the edge. We chose formaldehyde, uh, so, excuse me, methanol. It's a possible precursor to simple sugars and amino acids. These are the transitions we looked at. And our hypothesis was that if methanol was seen out there, it would really argue that prebiotic chemistry occurs throughout most of the galaxy. I should mention that this was done with the undergraduate student, Catherine Cephas, who's now at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. So when we started this project, we uh, chose this frequency, 104.3 gigahertz, to look for fingerprints. And we looked, and it doesn't look like there's anything there. And we were kind of surprised and disappointed. But when we looked at the transition, it was too hot and energy. So the temperature of the gas 
affects which transitions are populated. Uh, as an example, if we're, we're looking, this, this uh, transition would be at like a, over 100 Kelvin. But if the clouds are cold, it's never going to get hit by the hydrogen in a pocket at that level. So that's why we didn't see it. We chose those earlier frequencies to look for because those were some of the coldest available that our telescope could look at. And so after doing a little bit more research and looking in the right place, this is the closest source to the galactic center, but it's still over 50% farther than our solar system. And we have the transitions of methanol detected. And the good thing is that we don't just get one line. We have a band pass and we can see other things in the background. So we have unidentified lines as well. These transitions relate to methanol, which is an asymmetric top, it's an asymmetric molecule that's rotating along different axes. And the E and the A just refer to a torsional state, so the kind of the eclipse of the hydroxy proton to the methyl protons. So we know just by looking at these that methanol is present, that we have multiple transitions and we have a detection of the molecule itself, which would be very hard in something like IR or visible astronomy. So we're taking a trip to the outside edges of the galaxy now, we're increasing in distance. Uh, we still see the transitions going farther out, 21.4, and finally 23.5 kiloparsecs, four times that three times the distance of our solar system. We detected methyl on 19 out of the 20 sources that formaldehyde was previously observed in. And we have a kind of a problem. We, we see transitions, but how do we derive anything physically meaningful from it besides it's there? Well, it's uh, photophysics, right? You have the collisions. Uh, to a lower energy level, to a higher energy level, that molecule can then collisionally de-excite, so it can run into hydrogen and lose that energy, or it can emit a photon and lose energy that way. What we observe is the photons that somehow escape the cloud. To get something physically meaningful, we use a software called RADEX, which is a radiative transfer code. And we can input parameters such as the molecular hydrogen density, so how much hydrogen is in the cloud we're looking at, how hot is the cloud we're looking at, the line width, which deals with, again with the collisional rates, uh, the column density of the molecule, in other words, how much of the molecule is there. And it will calculate the transition intensity in something called the optical depth. So a problem that we can consider is if the cloud becomes too thick, a molecule which emits a photon uh, may have that photon not escape the cloud. It may be so thick that it gets absorbed by another molecule. So there is a ceiling. You could increase the amount of the molecule, but your transition intensity may not scale with that. It may hit a ceiling, a saturation point, if you will. So using the software, we can calculate column densities because we know the intensity of the line, we can model it. Uh, and the column density itself isn't really meaningful. What we can do is we can divide the molecular hydrogen column density and we get a relative abundance relative to hydrogen. And then we can compare it to other molecules. So this is just a table about the different abundances. Here are our results. We calculated the relative abundances of methanol and plotted it as a function of galactocentric radius. Uh, this is the Orion Nebula, it's close to our solar system. And you'll notice that there's no real big change as you triple the distance. Uh, metallicity should drop as you go to the edges of the galaxy, but these prebiotic molecules don't really are affected by that distance, this vast distance. Uh, it almost looks like it's increasing. 
What are the lower ones at about 17? Yes, those are lower, but their errors are larger because we have less integration time as well. So yes, it does look like it kind of goes down, but there are some here at the same galactocentric distance that are above eight. There is a spread, I will admit. Uh, but we had few sources at these distances. And does it dip or does it just go straight? We probably need more sources to determine that. But the fact that it didn't just plummet down with metallicity trends was surprising to us. Does that answer your question? And so uh, these another table of abundance and modeling parameters. I want to show you the temperatures which are derived for the clouds. We have 10 to 25 Kelvin. The fact that we can observe gas phase methanol at 10 Kelvin, 24 kiloparsecs from the galactic center is just incredible. Uh, these clouds are extraordinarily cold. How does organic chemistry happen in these areas? And here's just a map of the different sources. This orange dot is the location of our solar system, and then the uh, diameter of the black circles is relates to the relative abundances. So these spiral arms go very far out, but uh, just finding methanol at these distances is incredible. There's a lot of speculation as to how methanol forms and is present in the gas phase in the first place. Uh, many people believe that it cannot just be through gas phase reactions, that there has to be a solid state contribution uh, forming on ice grain surfaces, hydrogenation of, say, carbon monoxide, as an example. Uh, but the clouds are 10 Kelvin, so that's pretty cold for ice desorption. We don't know if there are unexplored gas phase reactions or if there's somehow cosmic ray contributions to ablating this stuff out. Uh, but the mystery continues. It does appear, uh, despite the dip in the center, to increase with galactocentric radius and is consistent with the detections of formaldehyde in those sources. So we can conclude that in terms of complex organic chemistry, it seems to exist even at the outskirts of the galaxy. There's uh, no real exclusion, even with supposed metallicity decreases. And so the Xeris group has grad students now who are looking at methyl cyanide, cyclic C3H2 to get really an inventory of things on the outer edge. And with that, we take a jump, an order of magnitude jump in chemical complexity to the interstellar fullerenes. Uh, C60 and C70 were first detected in 2010 using Spitzer IR and the planetary nebula TC1. This is just a video of the what it looks like. It looks like a soccer ball, made out of carbon. And much to my chagrin, it was not identified from radio astronomy because caveat to radio astronomy, you need a permanent dipole moment to observe transitions of those molecules. If you don't have a permanent dipole moment, you cannot observe the rotational transitions. C60 has no permanent dipole moment, even though it's the largest known molecule out in space. Uh, so it had to be identified through the IR. These are the red features are C60 IR emission and the blue correspond to C70. And you know, to someone who six atoms is a lot, 60 is incredible, right? It's a huge jump. Uh, this completely changed the understanding of how big things could be out there. And it was subsequently detected in a lot of sources and not really intuitive sources. So planetary nebula is full of ultraviolet radiation, which should destroy organic chemistry. Uh, it was found in Planetary nebula, protoplanetary nebula, reflection nebula, and in 2015, it was discovered that it's pretty much everywhere in the interstellar medium. It absorbs light as a what's called a diffuse interstellar band. 
which I'll discuss later. But while it was detected in all these different places, there was still the large question of how could it possibly form out in space? 60 carbon atoms and only 60 carbon atoms because there's 10,000 times as many hydrogen atoms in space as there are carbon atoms. Hydrogen will react with carbon up to extremely high temperatures to form what are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs instead of fullerenes. Uh, and so early on, it was proposed that, well, C60 must form in places in space that don't have hydrogen hydrogen deficient, which isn't a lot of places. And in 2010, um, almost immediately after that was proposed, Garcia Hernandez and found fullerenes in places that had hydrogen. So mystery, how could it form? Because carbon reacts so readily with hydrogen form PAHs, people said, well, maybe PAHs form C60 somehow. So this is an example of a pH, just like a graphene sheet, hydrogenated at the ends. The hypothesis was that it would be a multi-photon process, photoprocessing these sheets. You're going to have to break carbon-carbon bonds, rearrange them into pentagons, five-membered rings. You'll see here, C60 has a five-membered and six-membered rings. You're breaking bonds, you're going to have to, of course, dehydrogenate the PAH to get it to close. You're going to have to move the rings so those rings have to migrate and then close through this multi step process into the cage. Now, how do you form C60 with a sheet that only has 50 carbon atoms? You don't have the material to do it. How do you form C60 with a sheet that says 70 carbon atoms? You have to lose carbon atoms. Multi-photon process. There have been studies which indicated that C60 can only form from sheets that contain 60 to 66 carbon atoms. None of these sheets have actually been detected out in space. It's believed that they're there through IR emissions, but there's no millimeter wave, radio wave observations. So it's speculation as to the presence of the starting material itself. And so a lot of people didn't like this explanation and they propose an alternative, which is something called hydrogenated amorphous carbon grains. And these hack grains are a mixture of aromatic and aliphatic carbon. So uh, more chaotic. And this experiment in 1997 took hack grains and photoprocessed them and put the products through a mass spectrometer. Uh, this is the 60 carbon atom peak, but as the intensity increased in the laser radiation, C60 isn't really even a product. The smaller fullerenes like C40, which hasn't yet been detected, were thought to be the major component of hack processing. And so there are a bunch of schemes as to how this mixture of Aromatic and aliphatic carbon can perhaps close to form cages, or uh, maybe they're half baked and they don't actually close, and you have a bunch of this uh, assorted mixture just floating around. But there's a lot of uncertainties about that, about the photo desorption and how it can make the cages in the first place. Dooley and Hu did a laboratory experiment which put a hack film uh, on under different gas conditions. And they wanted to spectroscopically characterize what they made from these hack films. And uh, so they looked at two Raman lines using surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. But they noted in their conclusions that C60 is not abundant in our samples. If it was present, it would have to be bonded to other chemical groups in order to destroy the overall symmetry and suppress these Raman vibrational modes. And they concluded that they will, that something's being made, but it isn't C60 itself. It's something called protofullerenes, PFs. So this leads to the research I did in graduate school up to today. 
and that's connection to silicon carbide, an alternative to the PAH and PAC route. Silicon carbide is a common dust constituent of circumstellar envelopes, carbon-rich circumstellar envelopes. It's dust that we know is out there. We have observed it in radio observations, IR, uh, here at LPL, people pull them out of meteorites and their presence pre-solar grains. The vast majority of these silicon carbide grains have the 3C, the cubic polytype we pictured here where black is carbon and white is silicon. And so we noticed, uh, collaborators, myself, that there is material science literature talks about decomposition of silicon carbide. When you heat it, interesting things happen with this crystal lattice. Three layers will collapse and form one layer of graphene and form carbon nanobuds. So we thought silicon carbide we know is out there. We know it gets heated in out space. Could C60 and other interesting uh, prebiotic molecules be formed by heating silicon carbide? People had previously suggested that silicon carbide could react or uh, graphitize under heating, but that they would form PAHs. Again, there is a, a strong interest in the astronomical community on PAHs and their contribution to interstellar carbon. But a problem is that if you heat silicon carbide, it forms the graphene sheets. This explanation is somewhat backwards that it's hot as silicon carbide and as it cools, it forms graphene. And that's the opposite of the actual phenomenon itself, how it's recorded. So we know that many of the sources which have fullerenes have this silicon carbide IR emission as well. We found it was a good place to look at how fullerenes are made. So in 2018, our collaborator Tom Zega took an analog of silicon carbide dust, which we know is out in the envelopes, same size distribution, same crystal polytype, took it to Argonne National Laboratory, heated it to 1,000 degrees Celsius, and then bombarded it with 150 keV xenon to replicate the implantation of noble gas, which is again observed in pre-solar grains. Now, at the University of Arizona, the HF5000 TEM has better imaging capabilities. So we did post-mortem imaging of the grains after they're heated and also eels imaging. And of course, the purpose of this experiment is to replicate this closely as technically feasible, the heating of dust out in space to see what happens from that process. This is the Hitachi Blaze sample holder, which allows us to do this experiment. temperature control, we can ramp it up to 1100 degrees in under a second, uh, or we could take heating experiments several hours. So this is all lab on a chip that we can customize our temperature profiles. We deposit the sample on this little MEMS chip and it has a silicon nitride membrane, which the sample suspended on some holes in it. So these are the results from that first heating experiment. You see here, the dark contrast is the silicon carbide crystal. They're actually one laying on the other. They're electrostatically connected to one another, but you'll notice that there is a change in contrast on the edges of the grain. We measured the lattice spacing and it's 0.34 nanometers, indicative of graphite. So silicon carbide, graphite was on the silicon carbide initially. Heating it up, it made graphite. And you'll notice on the very ends where these red end arrows indicate, there are buds, hemispherical buds on the ends. C60 is extraordinarily difficult to image with TEM. It's 0.7 nanometers in diameter. So it needs to be attached to something. So this inset is the C60 molecule, which has been attached to a nanotube. And you'll see that the uh, 
morphology is very similar. So we were, uh, oh, we also did eels mapping on this whole section here and boxes one, two, three, I'll show you this next slide. The eels mapping looked at the pi star and sigma star features. The pi star indicates uh, pi bonding, so graphite. The sigma star can be present in graphite or sp3 hybridized carbon. So red is pi star, blue is sigma star. The composite map shows that indeed the extremity of the grain has pi star enrichment, graphite enrichment. And our collaborator, Pierre Hanacor and Sanchiko Mari uh, discovered a pre-solar grain, graphite grain, with a silicon carbide core in the center. This is the opposite of thermodynamic condensation sequences. Graphite has a much higher condensation temperature than silicon carbide, so why is silicon carbide in the middle? It should be reversed. It should be silicon carbide with graphite center, but it isn't. The morphology and the uh, potential AGB origins of this grain suggests that at one point this was all silicon carbide. It was heated and thermally decomposed almost completely and this little remnant core remains. But that this was a transformed silicon carbide. So the process indicates that grains are indeed heated to the point of thermal decomposition. Well, we published this in the Astrophysical Journal Letters in 2018 as, as a facile route to making then the most complex molecules known. We know that the starting material is there. We know the temperatures that they're heated at. We know the vacuum conditions, et cetera. And it seems a lot cleaner than pH photoprocessing or hack photoprocessing. We, we uh, had a lot of attention from this result. We've got a Nature News and Views on it, but we wanted to explore further because material science literature indicates you heat silicon carbide a little bit hotter, you'll form carbon nanotubes. It'll grow like a forest out of grain. So we wanted to do this all in one place uh, in the house. This time we heated the silicon carbide sample to 1,050 degrees Celsius instead of 1,000. Uh, we didn't use ion bombardment. We did it at the HF 5000 in the basement here, uh, and we did TEM imaging. So here are our results from that experiment. This is the grain at 1,050 degrees Celsius for a couple seconds you'll see that the exterior is covered in these polyp type buds, carbon buds. And here's another inset of C60 on a nanotube. The morphology of these buds are identical, identical in diameter and curvature to C60 emission on TPM. For all intents and purposes, we are making C60 on the surface of the silicon carbide. But, at 1,050 degrees, when we heat for a time period of a few minutes, those buds grow. These are multi-walled carbon nanotubes coming out of the grains. Time scale of a few minutes. Again, this is an inset of a multi-walled carbon nanotube formed by completely different means. But we were shocked when we saw this. Uh, just a few minutes of heating at that temperature formed these incredibly complex structures. And we replicated the experiment. It's a completely different uh, run, same temperature profile, same uh, time. And again, there are nanotubes forming all over the place. Some of these are quite large. A comparison between two experiments shows that with the consistent heating profile, the structures are consistent. So we are forming carbon nanotubes. Both times they're capped at the ends, they're rounded. Uh, it's important to note that that curvature forms the five-membered rings naturally uh, in the carbon sheets. 
and then seven membered rings at the interface of the bud and the silicon carbide bed. We have five layers about on average for these structures and they're about five nanometers long. C60 is 0.7 nanometers in diameter. And the silicon carbide will thermally decompose at this temperature and looking at the electron beam of the microscope, uh, we don't think that it's the electron beam itself which is forming the nanostructures or that it's contributing so much temperature, like it's not at 1500 degrees from the beam because it's on a membrane which decomposes at 1100 degrees. So the silicon carbide was hotter than 1100 degrees if it melt through. We think there's an upper limit on the temperature contribution, but over the period of a couple hours, uh, this is before the heating, this is after the heating. The silicon carbide kind of withers away and the nanostructures will fall off in the vacuum. They are mobile. They are removed pretty readily from the grains. And so we have now a chemical scenario for how the most complex molecules are made out in space. And it's uh, counterintuitive that the dust which accumulates around the star and the circumstellar envelope over millennia, over millions of years, star dies, AGB star, ordinary star, average star. It doesn't take extraordinary supernova events to make this material. That shock wave will propagate through the dust envelope, just smack right into it, heat it a period of maybe an hour to the temperatures that we've discussed, about 1100 degrees Celsius. That will decompose silicon carbide, form graphene sheets. Graphene gets distorted because the grains themselves have topology. It's not a wafer uh, like they use in the computer manufacturing. It has surface imperfections. Those are responsible for the curvature of the sheets and the buds, C60. And if the temperature is at 1,050 degrees for a period of a few minutes, there's a strong potential for the formation of carbon nanotubes. Now, just kind of back of the envelope calculation, right, of the, the size of these nanotubes. Those nanotubes that you've seen contain more carbon atoms than all of the molecules in the table I showed you earlier put together. This would represent a huge jump in chemical complexity, thousands of carbon atoms instead of 60. Uh, how do they react with the gases that are present? They're, they're highly radiation stable, but you know, it, it could take a lifetime just to discuss and examine the interactions of these nanotubes with other molecules. What do they form? Do they degrade? Is there a spectrum from uh, you know, diatomic to thousands of molecules and in between there are no gaps or are the nanotubes stable and they don't decompose? We also are strongly interested in the potential for these nanotubes to be carriers of the diffuse interstellar bands. I mentioned earlier, C60 is a diffuse interstellar band. These are absorption features, which for a hundred years, no one understood what they were. They're everywhere in the diffuse interstellar space. They absorb wavelengths of light from stars and C60, 2015, the C60 cation was identified as one of the hundreds of bands. There are still many carriers which are unidentified. Carbon nanotubes, we believe, are formed in the exact same process as C60, which you know is out there, and they are strong optical absorbers. In fact, some of the strongest optical absorbers. These could all represent different nanotubes, different lengths, perhaps different a number of constituent walls. So we're really excited about the implications of these findings. Uh, we're trying right now to characterize these nanotubes spectroscopically, get a wavelength so that we can actually assign some of these absorption features to the bands. Uh, that's a big mystery. And so I have many people to thank. Uh, 
National Science Foundation, the Zurich Group, Tom Zega, Satsuko, and uh, Jane, and here. And thank you for your time, your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, any questions online? I have first question. So for the graphene, it's you know they have the they actually bonded really strongly together, right? In order to change the what how much energy is that needed to actually what energy? So I just give me an idea. About so it. we saw the bud formation almost immediately. Uh, in terms of we, we, when we did this latest experiment, we didn't see the sheet form and then it took an hour to form the bud or anything. Uh -huh. The buds almost immediately formed. It's, um, I, I think that the sterics of the grains, mm -hmm. because they do have surface imperfections, right? right? And, and the smaller they are, the more the curvature is of the site. So I, I believe that's just perfectly natural for these sheets to distort that there's a surface topography makes it so and there have been studies which you know they'll take a silicon carbide wafer and they'll scratch it and heat it and the scratch is where nanotubes form that it's really clean that you get this uh it's very flexible yeah so and, the graphene sheet is actually very flexible that's it right kind of, kind of and they're not very uh well bonded to each other right yeah. That you would have uh, one come out, maybe you have some underneath it. Yeah, well, because there's only one single, single layer, that is easier to. Okay. A another thing that I just find incredible about this is gas phase chemistry. How you would have, say, uh, I don't know, say a di or triatomic carbon molecule forming C60 through gas phase interactions. It just isn't happening, right? We don't have a mechanism for that. But silicon carbide is a diatomic, right? It's just abundant and it's in the solid mm -hmm. state. It's sequestered up to that point of the final post AGB shots. So we take something that is stoichiometrically simple and abundant, heat it, and we make some of the most complex molecules out there it's in a hydrogen containing environment. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. The teacher? Uh, yeah, uh, the teacher, do you want to just speak, uh, speak out or I can read your uh, yeah. She's comments. right there. I'm fine to speak up. Uh, hi, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question is, I have two questions actually. The first uh, is uh, just, um, oh, um, it is interesting that you don't see a gradient between the molecule, I think is methanol versus hydrogen and the galactocentric distance. Uh, I was wondering, just out of curiosity, how were these distances measured and what is the typical error bar for those? Yes, that's a good question. We used the uh, values from Blair. So they had a catalog of sources and their galactocentric radius. We just looked at the sources where they had formaldehyde detections and we used that. I, they talk about how those distances are measured in the Blair 2008 paper. I'm not familiar offhand with it because that's more astrometric stuff. And those distances do have some play to them, right? That even our own solar system, I was just shocked that we don't know the distance of our solar system from the center of the galaxy. So I'm not sure about those error bars, but, um, and I, I should preface this by saying, I'm not sure we can exactly establish a trend like the molecular abundances are increasing with distance so much because it would be good to have more sources. Yeah, uh, yeah. More sources, even at higher radii, uh, the, uh, the errors in our abundances were a consequence of the line intensity uncertainty, which we propagated through the abundance calculations. And I have a second question. Uh, so I used to work in fullerene. I was in the group by Garcia Hernandez to observe fullerene and other molecules with Spitzer data. Oh. And uh, as I recall, that was about 10 years ago, as I recall, um, my own uh, Spitzer data sets, there were 150 galactic plant nebula and then other, I don't know, 60, 70 extra galactic plant nebula and 
in the end, we, we didn't look for fullerene, that was serendipitous. But um, in the end, we only, I mean, there are only a few planetary nebulae with fullerene. So I really like very much your experiment, the last part of your talk. And I think that uh, uh, it seems like uh, it works and is uh, definitely very well explained how fullerene is formed. But so why, I mean, I always ask myself, why don't we see fullerene in all those planetary nebulae? After all, there is a lot of carbon around. And um, the planetary nebula is a very, very quick phase of stellar evolution, extremely quick. It's, uh, it's thousand years with respect to million years. Uh, so maybe is something that we observe rarely because it happened to a at a certain phase of the planetary nebula life. And by, stati by statistically, we don't see every time that it happens. On the other hand, fullerene, as far as I remember, it's very sturdy. So once it's formed, uh, cannot be crashed easily. Is that correct? I might, and there might be new things that I'm not aware of. Yes, so, it's a good, a good question. And fullerene's, uh, I'm not sure if you've read the paper by Franco Cataldo. He examined the radiation stability of fullerene and said that it, if shielded, it could survive for giga year time scales, which is great. And uh, I think it's important to note that the greatest contributor of matter to the interstellar medium are the average stars, the AGB phase, that the supernovae don't contribute nearly as much as the average or intermediate mass stars. And because C60, especially the cation, we know is prevalent everywhere in the interstellar medium as a diffuse interstellar band carrier, whether or not they're detected in planetary nebulae, like all of them, like you said, how prevalent the detection is. I think that we may have trouble with uh, the IR detection in planetary nebulae. But then we have the optical absorption in the later stages. So we know it's present in planetary nebula, planetary nebula, and we see it everywhere in interstellar space. So, um, but we're using different methods to see it. And we unfortunately know radio astronomy to use it. So that's a, uh, I also think it's interesting that nanotubes are very radiation stable. So I think that it survives the formation process and the protoplanetary kind of post AGB phase, survives the UV radiation, and then it may get shielded over time. So does that answer your question? Uh, more than a question was a suggestion. I mean, it would be interesting to, to use the short stellar evolution time of planetary nebulae to constrain and to see if uh, the formation of fullerene could be really occur at, in the way that you describe or not. And if it goes, or maybe we can learn something new about the evolution of planetary nebulae. It was just, uh, just an, inter an expression of interest for those two fields can go together. Yes, thank you. And of course, uh, James Webb coming online and uh, those observations, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more about space fullerenes. And especially what I'm interested in is the, the spatial distribution of it. That Garcia Hernandez uh, map, uh, I believe it was IC418. They had kind of a C60 emission and silicon carbide emission, and they were like co-spatial. And we put that in our 2018 paper. So it's, uh, uh, I'd be very interested in IR emission mapping out that emission. We have two more questions. Oh, okay. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Samantha. Samantha? Hi. Hi. Um, nice talk. Uh, I guess I'm curious back to the methanol. Um, just for my own curiosity, uh, was the methanol that you, when you were calculating in your radex, was it optically thin or optically thick in these more distant cores? It was optically thin, if I recall correctly. We didn't see a lot of optical thickness. Okay. Too. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, and then I was wondering, too, if um, since these clouds are at, like, various distances, did you think at all, did you correct at all for maybe, like, source size and beam filling fraction dilution that could maybe affect your abundances and, and the distance trend is just, just thinking That's, about that. I believe we were being, I think we're being diluted in all of those sources. So um, 
and that just means that the intensity would be stronger. And so uh, with the transitions. So all the all the cores are bigger than your your beam. I'm sorry, I'm trying to recall. Well, oh, it's okay. <laughs> Beam size, I think it was about 60 arc seconds, so about an arc minute. I have no offhand the frequency, I don't have a calculator for it, but I'm trying to remember, we did position switching on those sources to be safe. Yeah, I just wonder like if you're, when you're calculating the abundances, since these sources are at all different distances, um, right, and your beam is going to, yeah, we didn't have the source size information. Uh, right, yeah, so I just wonder. Sources, right? Yeah, yeah, but it would be just be interesting to see if, if maybe that's why there's not a, I don't know. And, and really, uh, we weren't expecting to do abundance calculations for 20 different sources. Uh, we weren't expecting to see methanol in all of them. I mean, it's pretty much all of the sources we looked at had it, so we were, I think, kind of quick with the, Rate X analysis, and there's not a lot of information on them. I can't remember anything about source size offhand. This is a couple of years ago too. So. Oh yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> I was just, I was just wondering. It was that was cool. Yeah, and just another quick thing about methanol, since um, I, I like studying methanol and cold cores myself. But um, there's a paper uh, with new surface reaction chemistry that probably explains methanol in these. 10 Kelvin temperatures by um, Miwa Jin and Rob Garrod in 2021. And so like, I don't know if you ever come back to looking at cold cores and, and, and the complex chemistry that could be, you could check to see if your abundances make sense with their models. Okay, thank you. Uh, I remember there's a lake drink and uh, a bunch of like ice and gas phase explanations for methanol, but it's not very well constrained. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks. Okay, we have one more question from Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, now if there's time, uh, quickly, yeah. So you, you mentioned obviously the longstanding problem of the diffuse interstellar bands um, and that they can be connected to, I guess, nanotubes and other complex organics. I'm just curious the the status of that. Like, how specific is the identification of a line to a specific molecule, or where where is that at right now? So, unfortunately, it's a very difficult problem because C60. There's only one C60, right? Carbon nanotubes. That's really a class of molecules that it could have a lot more variation in the number of carbon atoms, right? The number of walls whether it's uh, capped on the end. And so the you know, finding the optical absorption of different carbon nanotubes, either on silicon carbide or detached from silicon carbide is a big experimental problem that we're trying to face, but that's you know, why I'm a postdoc, <laughs> they're paying me. So I'm trying to figure that out, how best to, uh, what I'm trying to do is get a wavelength for what I should on the slides that we see nanotubes of a certain size distribution, we need wavelengths, what they absorb at. And I'm pretty sure that they're going to be in the optical and they're going to be very strong uh, because they've measured the optical absorption of carbon nanotubes. They have the, you know, the Vanta black, the vertically aligned nanotube arrays. That's like the blackest paint that they ever have made. Uh, so we know that it's very strong. It really takes all those photons. It's just a question of, uh, the bands are very narrow too. So there's a whole catalog of them, NASA has them, different wavelengths and no one knows what they are, right? And so I'm trying to find a wavelength and then go to the database and say, aha, there it is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a problem because they're nanoscale materials and uh, you know, do they change when they get cool, right? When they cool down from a thousand degrees? If, are they in gas phase or in, in solid state? So there are a lot of problems, but uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I hope that answered it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Okay, that's about the time and we have run out of questions. So, so 
That's all then. Thanks for Thank you, everyone. Next week.